It's milk and biscuits time. Aladdin Story Part 10 On the morning after the restoration of Aladdin's palace, the Sultan was looking out of his window and mourning over the fate of his daughter when he thought that he saw the vacancy created by the disappearance of the palace to be again filled up. On looking more attentively, he was convinced beyond the power of doubt that it was his son-in-law's palace. Joy and gladness succeeded to sorrow and grief. He at once ordered a horse to be saddled, which he mounted that instant, thinking he could not make haste enough to the place. Aladdin rose that morning by daybreak, put on one of the most magnificent habits his wardrobe afforded, and went up into the hall of 24 windows, from whence he perceived the Sultan approaching and received him at the foot of the great staircase, helping him to dismount. He led the Sultan into the princess's apartment. The happy father embraced her with tears of joy, and the princess, on her side, afforded similar testimonies of her extreme pleasure. After a short interval devoted to mutual explanations of all that had happened, the Sultan restored Aladdin to his favour and expressed his regret for the apparent harshness with which he had treated him. My son, said he, be not displeased at my proceedings against you. They arose from my paternal love, and therefore you ought to forgive the excesses to which it hurried me. Sire, replied Aladdin, I have not the least reason to complain of your conduct, since you did nothing but what your duty required. This infamous magician, the basest of men, was the sole cause of my misfortune. The African magician, who was thus twice foiled in his endeavour to ruin Aladdin, had a younger brother, who was as skilful a magician as himself, and exceeded him in wickedness and hatred of mankind. By mutual agreement, they communicated with each other once a year, however widely separate might be their place of residence from each other. The younger brother, not having received as usual his annual communication, prepared to take a horoscope and ascertain his brother's proceedings. He, as well as his brother, always carried a geomantic square instrument about him. He prepared the sand, cast the points, and drew the figures. On examining the planetary crystal, he found that his brother was no longer living, but had been poisoned, and by another observation, that he was in the capital of the Kingdom of China. Also, that the person who had poisoned him was of mean birth, though married to a princess, a sultan's daughter. When the magician had informed himself of his brother's fate, he resolved immediately to avenge his death and at once departed for China, where, after crossing plains, rivers, mountains, deserts, and a long tract of country without delay, he arrived after incredible fatigues. When he came to the capital of China, he took a lodging at a khan. His magic art soon revealed to him that Aladdin was the person who had been the cause of the death of his brother. He had heard, too, all the persons of repute in the city talking of a woman called Fatima, who was retired from the world, and of the miracle she wrought. As he fancied that this woman might be serviceable to him in the project he had conceived, he made more minute inquiries and requested to be informed more particularly who that holy woman was, and what sort of miracles she performed. What? said the person whom he addressed. Have you never seen or heard of her? She is the admiration of the whole town for her fasting, her austerities, and her exemplary life. Except Mondays and Fridays, she never stirs out of her little cell. And on those days on which she comes into the town, she does an infinite deal of good, for there is not a person who is diseased, but she puts her hand on them and cures them. Having ascertained the place where the hermitage of the holy woman was, the magician went at night, and plunging a poniard into her heart, Ayur, killed this good woman. In the morning, he dyed his face of the same hue as hers, and arraying himself in her garb, taking her veil, the large necklace she wore round her waist, and her stick, went straight to the palace of Aladdin. As soon as the people saw the holy woman, as they imagined him to be, they presently gathered about him in a great crowd, some begged his blessing, some kissed his hand, and others, more reserved, only the hem of his garment, while others, suffering from disease, stooped for him to lay his hands upon them, which he did, muttering some words in form of prayer, and in short, 
counterfeiting so well that everybody took him for the holy woman. He came at last to the square before Aladdin's palace. The crowd and the noise was so great that the princess, who was in the hall of four and twenty windows, heard it and asked what was the matter. One of her women told her it was a great crowd of people collected about the holy woman to be cured of diseases by the imposition of her hands. The princess, who had long heard of this holy woman, but had never seen her, was very desirous to have some conversation with her, which the chief officer perceiving told her it was an easy matter to bring her to her if she desired and commanded it. And the princess, expressing her wishes, he immediately sent four slaves for the pretended holy woman. As soon as the crowd saw the attendants from the palace, they made way. And the magician, perceiving also that they were coming for him, advanced to meet them, overjoyed to find his plot succeed so well. Holy woman, said one of the slaves, the princess wants to see you and has sent us for you. The princess does me too great an honor, replied the false Fatima. I am ready to obey her command, and at the same time followed the slaves to the palace. When the pretended Fatima had made her obeisance, the princess said, My good mother, I have one thing to request, which you must not refuse me. It is to stay with me, that you may edify me with your way of living, and that I may learn from your good example. Princess, said the counterfeit Fatima, I beg of you not to ask what I cannot consent to without neglecting my prayers and devotion. That shall be no hindrance to you, answered the princess. I have a great many apartments unoccupied. You shall choose which you like best and have as much liberty to perform your devotions as if you were in your own cell. The magician, who really desired nothing more than to introduce himself into the palace, where it would be a much easier matter for him to execute his designs, did not long excuse himself from accepting the obliging offer which the princess made him. Princess, said he, Whatever resolution a poor wretched woman as I am may have made to renounce the pomp and grandeur of this world, I dare not presume to oppose the will and commands of so pious and charitable a princess. Upon this the princess, rising up, said, Come with me, I will show you what vacant apartments I have, that you may make choice of that you like best. The magician followed the princess, and of all the apartments she showed him made choice of that which was the worst, saying that it was too good for him and that he only accepted it to please her. Afterward, the princess would have brought him back again into the great hall to make him dine with her, but he, considering that he should then be obliged to show his face, which he had always taken care to conceal with Fatima's veil, and fearing that the princess should find out that he was not Fatima, begged of her earnestly to excuse him, telling her that he never ate anything but bread and dried fruits, and desiring to eat that slight repast in his own apartment. The princess granted his request, saying, You may be as free here, good mother, as if you were in your own cell. I will order you a dinner, but remember, I expect you as soon as you have finished your repast. After the princess had dined, and the false Fatima had been sent for by one of the attendants, he again waited upon her. My good mother, said the princess, I am overjoyed to see so holy a woman as yourself, who will confer a blessing upon this palace. But now I am speaking of the palace. Pray, how do you like it? And before I show it all to you, tell me first what you think of this hall. Upon this question, the counterfeit Fatima surveyed the hall from one end to the other. When he had examined it well, he said to the princess, As far as such a solitary being as I am, who am unacquainted with what the world calls beautiful, can judge, this hall is truly admirable. There wants but one thing. What is that, good mother? demanded the princess. Tell me, I conjure you. For my part, I always believed and have heard say it wanted nothing, but if it does, it shall be supplied. Princess, said the false Fatima, with great dissimulation, forgive me the liberty I have taken, but my opinion is, if it can be of any importance, that if a rock's egg were hung up in the middle of the dome, this hall would have no parallel in the four quarters of the world, and your palace would be the wonder of the universe. My good mother, said the princess, what is a rock, and where may one get an egg? Princess, replied the pretended Fatima, it is a bird of prodigious size, 
which inhabits the summit of Mount Caucasus. The architect who built your palace can get you one. After the princess had thanked the false Fatima for what she believed her good advice, she conversed with her upon other matters, but could not forget the rock's egg, which she resolved to request of Aladdin when next he should visit her apartments. He did so in the course of that evening, and shortly after he entered, the princess thus addressed him. I always believed that our palace was the most superb, magnificent, and complete in the world. But I will tell you now what it wants, and that is a rock's egg hung up in the midst of the dome. Princess, replied Aladdin, it is enough that you think it wants such an ornament. You shall see by the diligence which I use in obtaining it, that there is nothing which I would not do for your sake. Aladdin left the Princess Budir al Budur that moment, and went up into the hall of four and twenty windows, where, pulling out of his bosom the lamp, which after the danger he had been exposed to, he always carried about him, he rubbed it, upon which the genie immediately appeared. Genie, said Aladdin, I command thee in the name of this lamp, bring a rock's egg to be hung up in the middle of the dome of the hall of the palace. Aladdin had no sooner pronounced these words than the hall shook as if ready to fall, and the genie said in a loud and terrible voice, Is it not enough that I and the other slaves of the lamp have done everything for you, but you, by an unheard of ingratitude, must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome? This attempt deserves that you, the princess and the palace, should be immediately reduced to ashes but you are spared because this request does not come from yourself. Its true author is the brother of the African magician, your enemy, whom you have destroyed. He is now in your palace disguised in the habit of the holy woman Fatima, whom he has murdered. At his suggestion, your wife makes this pernicious demand. His design is to kill you, therefore take care of yourself. After these words, the genie disappeared. Aladdin resolved at once what to do. He returned to the princess's apartment and, without mentioning a word of what had happened, sat down and complained of a great pain which had suddenly seized his head. On hearing this, the princess told him how she had invited the holy Fatima to stay with her and that she was now in the palace and at the request of the prince, ordered her to be summoned to her at once. When the pretended Fatima came, Aladdin said, "'Come hither, good mother, I am glad to see you here at so fortunate a time. I am tormented with a violent pain in my head and request your assistance and hope you will not refuse me that cure which you impart to afflicted persons. So saying, he rose, but held down his head. The counterfeit Fatima advanced toward him with his hand all the time on a dagger concealed in his girdle under his gown, which Aladdin observing, he snatched the weapon from his hand pierced him to the heart with his own dagger, and then pushed him down on the floor. My dear prince, what have you done? cried the princess in surprise. You have killed the holy woman. No, my princess, answered Aladdin with emotion. I have not killed Fatima, but a villain who would have assassinated me if I had not prevented him. This wicked man, added he, uncovering his face, is the brother of the magician who attempted our ruin. He has strangled the true Fatima and disguised himself in her clothes with intent to murder me. Aladdin then informed her how the genie had told him these facts and how narrowly she and the palace had escaped destruction through his treacherous suggestion which had led to her request. Thus was Aladdin delivered from the persecution of the two brothers, who were magicians. Within a few years afterward, the Sultan died in a good old age, and as he left no male children, the Princess Budir al Budur succeeded him, and she and Aladdin reigned together many years and left a numerous and illustrious posterity. <laughs>